Good morning, church. Glad to be talking to you, even if it's virtually this morning. We've had a rough couple of weeks, and it's one of those times where um, really missing you guys and sorry that I can't be with you in person this morning. Just want you to know that uh, the distance we have between us and you at normal times is tough enough when things are hard, but this is, um, it's been a rough time and know that Sparks, the Sparks family is praying for you. Their hearts are with you way over here. We wish we could see you way over there. And so, um, as we get started this morning, let's go ahead and begin, if you don't mind, with a word of prayer. I want to guide you through some prayer, and then we will jump into our text for the day. And so what I'm going to do, this is something we do in our morning prayers uh, every morning over on my page that I maintain because of that school project I started. Um, I offer prompts and then maintain silence for you to add your own prayer to those prompts. Won't do the full thing because that would take 20 minutes by itself, but uh, just a shortened version of that. And so, here we go. Will you pray with me? Most merciful Father, full of love, with heavy hearts we ask that you hear our prayers this morning. We want to pray for loved ones and family members and friends in this time of turmoil. Lord, hear our prayers. For those who are sick, for those who are dying, for those who grieve loss, for those who have been wounded and broken by this time of uncertainty and tension and darkness in our world, Lord, hear our prayers. For your people around the world, and your people especially in Fernville, in the greater Fairview area, that we may hold on to the hope that Jesus made possible in the resurrection. We may act as those who know the end of the story, that we may be light in the midst of this darkness. Lord, hear our prayers. We ask all of these things in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, who is our Lord, who lives and reigns with you along with your spirit now and forever. Amen. Today is Ascension Sunday, and as such, we have an Ascension text, one of several in the New Testament. It's an interesting one, but I hope that by the time we're through, you'll see why we've picked this one. If you have a Bible, or if you just want to listen along, we're going to be reading from the end of Acts chapter 7, and this comes at the end of Stephen's long monologue to the Jewish people who opposed him as he spread the gospel. We'll start in verse 51 just to get a flavor of his message, and then we want to pay particular attention to their response and what happens after that. Hear the word of the Lord. You stubborn people. 
in your thoughts and hearing, you are like those who have had no part in God's covenant. You continuously set yourself against the Holy Spirit, just like your ancestors did. Was there a single prophet your ancestors didn't harass? They even killed those who predicted the coming of the righteous one, and you betrayed and murdered him. You received the law given by angels, but you haven't kept it. Once the council members heard these words, they were enraged and began to grind their teeth at Stephen. But Stephen, enabled by the Holy Spirit, stared into heaven and saw God's majesty and Jesus standing at God's right side. He exclaimed, Look, I can see heaven on display in the human one standing at God's right side. And at this they shrieked and covered their ears, and together they charged at him. They threw him out of the city, and they began to stone him. The witnesses placed their coats in the care of a young man named Saul, and as they battered him with stones, Stephen prayed, Lord Jesus, accept my life. And falling to his knees, he shouted, Lord, don't hold this sin against them. And then he died. Since the end of November, we've been walking through the life of Jesus in uh, the life of our church. We do this uh, every year, at least every year since I've been there. So this is the second year we've done it. And we do that because we are Jesus people. We have given our lives to him. We have pledged ourselves to him. And so with that commitment, there's no better way to spend five, six months of our year, every year, uh, walking with the one to whom we've pledged ourselves to in an effort to get to know him better. But in the telling of that story, one of the chapters that's often overlooked is uh, precisely this chapter of Ascension. Um, it's this weird little story thrown into the first chapter of Acts where Jesus returns to heaven and everybody's looking up at him, kind of wondering what's going on. And it's such an interesting, awe-inspiring sort of thing that an angel in Acts 1 actually has to appear and say, Hey, you guys, um, he gave you a job. He told you to do something. Get to it. And we've never known really what to do with that, so we've always passed over it very quickly. And we've talked about this in the past. And a lot of this retelling of the story of Jesus every year really is just review. Um, but let me review the basics real fast, and then I want to make an application for us today. The Ascension is about Jesus reigning over the entirety of God's cosmos from heaven. In the New Testament world, heaven was not some place that you escaped to after you death and after you died. So the Ascension is not um, Jesus escaping from this mortal coil to go off for an disembodied eternal experience over yonder or beyond the bright blue. But in the New Testament world, heaven was the control room for the entire cosmos. This is the place from where God rules. This is his seat of authority. This is his throne. And so um, sometimes we will refer to the goings-on in Washington by various government officials as not President Trump did this or the Senate did this or the Congress did this or even the Supreme Court did this, but Washington did this, and that's a way of referring to the seat of authority. Jesus returns to the throne room of God in the Ascension. This is uh, the same Jesus who in Matthew's Gospel, just a few days earlier, had come to the disciples and said, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Uh, this is him taking the throne to exercise that authority. He ascends to heaven, the throne room of God, and he sits down at the right hand of God. That is a position of authority. That is a position of ruling. That is a position of sovereignty. And so you'll notice, and you can go back and look at this this afternoon in Acts chapter 2, when uh, Peter is declaring that first gospel sermon, so-called, on the day of Pentecost, the, the ultimate argument that he makes not only is that Jesus has been resurrected, but this Jesus who was resurrected, who has been defeated from the grave, has ascended to heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. And it is only then, with the resurrection plus the ascension to the right hand of the Father, that Peter declares him as Lord, it's a term that Caesar used in his world. The ultimate authority, the buck stops here, and Christ, which was a kingly term. It was the Messiah, the anointed one in the Jewish culture. They anointed 
their kings. He is Lord and King, seated in the throne room at the right hand of the Father. And so the ascension is a way of saying that even though rebellion persists, even though the forces of darkness that hold sway over this world and have for millennia still fight their battles, that fundamental, that decisive victory over those powers has already been won in the cross and the resurrection of Jesus. And as such, those powers have been dethroned. Uh, this was what was going on in that dream in Daniel we've talked about where monsters rule over the world, but the Ancient of Days sets up his throne room and he brings those monsters to trial and he condemns them and sets up the Son of Man instead. Uh, that decisive battle has been won and even though his project is not finished, it has begun, Jesus rules over the world. This is God's world. And so... When you look at it in its context, one of the things we want to pay attention to is that the ascension is an essential part of the story. It is a crucial part of the story. Without the ascension, the cross, the resurrection wouldn't carry near the freight that they do. And so I want to think for just a minute about how that applies to our practical lives. Probably the application is already jumping out of your mind. You've already gone there, but just for a minute. A few weeks ago, we spent some time with the fruit of the Spirit in Galatians chapter 5. We talked about how those fruit are really uh, what the ethical tradition would call virtues. Virtues are these embodied practices, these rhythms, these matter of character, of second nature that point us in a healthy direction, that lead us into a healthy life. And the fruit of the Spirit represent those. They, they grow in us. They are developed in us. We lean into them, and they lead us to human flourishing. And uh, the thing about virtue is that virtues usually fall on a spectrum between two vices. And one of the virtues I've been thinking about a lot lately is the virtue of courage. Um, courage is considered in the Christian ethical tradition one of the cardinal virtues. That is one of the core matters of character upon which all other matters of character turn. If you think about a door, courage is one of the hinges that allows that door to open and shut. And courage stands in a spectrum between two vices on either side of it. There's a balance between those two vices. On the one side, the vice um, on the side of courage is the vice of uh, just cowardice. We live in a world where lots of scary things happen, where things are broken, where things are dark. And you'll notice that the Bible never denies the scariness of the world. It never says, oh, it's just all in your head. Um, it always takes the brokenness of the world seriously. It never pretends like that's going to be easy. But cowardice is the vice that, as a matter of character and a matter of habit and a matter of routine, just bows to the brokenness of the world. It's completely controlled by the brokenness of the world. And on the other side of courage is the vice of foolhardiness. And foolhardiness is the virtue, or the vice rather, that says in the face of a broken world, there's really nothing to be scared of. It's all in your head. Let's just go do it. And so courage is that virtue that stands between fear or cowardice, which says, oh, it's scary. Everything is scary. Let's be afraid. And between the vice of foolhardiness that says, you silly people, there's nothing to be afraid of. And courage is that habit, that rhythm of life, that matter of character that says, in the face of a scary world, we recognize that scariness, but we are going to wisely and faithfully engage that world anyway. We're not going to kowtow to fear. We're not going to pretend like there's nothing to be afraid of and everything is really okay and it's just all in your head or it's some government conspiracy or it's some tyrannical overreach or the scientists are just making things up. I'm just throwing out some random examples you may have heard. But we're going to face down the scariness and the brokenness of the world and we're going to do so with faith and wisdom.
and acting such, we develop the virtue of courage. But courage is an interesting thing these days. Uh, the simple fact of the matter is that the world has always been a scary place. It's true that up until recently, a good many of us have been able to ignore that simple fact about the world. It's easy enough to ignore the brokenness of the world when you have Facebook and Netflix and your work and all of the pleasures that our modern life has afforded us to distract us. We could always just change the channel or turn our phones off or go to another page or drive a little faster or eat some comfort food to kind of push away the scariness of the world. But the fact of the matter is the world's always been a scary place. We've been able to pretend like it's not, but uh, COVID-19 is... Um, all of the complications that came with it, they are really nothing new. They're just a new chapter in a world that has long been broken. Um, but it has brought this brokenness to the forefront, hasn't it? And that's true no matter which side of the spectrum you're on. You're more aware of the brokenness now, whether or not you're taking this virus seriously or you're not thinking about it at all, or you think it's a conspiracy theory or you fall anywhere in between any of those positions in the spectrum. It is evident from every angle, from a health angle, from a social angle, from a psychological angle, from a political angle, from an economic angle, that things just aren't right and the world is scary. And it seems in the broader discourse that all anybody wants to do is either on the one side, and I say all anybody wants to do, I'm speaking with way too broad of a brush there. But it seems that we have, by and large, been clumping people into two camps. And there's that temptation, not everybody falls to it, but there's that temptation to clump everybody into two camps. And on the one camp are those who are afraid, and on the other camp are those who aren't afraid. And courage is the thing that falls kind of in between, but why should we be courageous? Why should we accept the fact that, yes, there are, with this side, things that are scary, but we do have to act in the face of that? Where do we find the courage to go on? And the answer for Christians very simply is this. We find the courage to go on in a scary world because we know that God has declared through Jesus Christ that this scary world does not have the final say. And the way I've been thinking about it this week is this. It has been enormously difficult and it has been a bit of a loss and a matter of grief for me and I know for some of you to not be able to worship with one another these last few months in the way that we're accustomed to. Um, Easter is, in the week leading up to Easter, is one of the highlights of my year. And it absolutely centers on being able to do it with people. That is part of the joy of celebrating things like Easter. Ascension Sunday, today is one of my favorite Sundays of the year, and I love being with you and declaring that the Lord rules over the earth and that he sits at the right hand of God. And we're missing something essential. We're missing something beautiful. We're missing something powerful and, and something vital when we can't do those things together. Um, when we can't take communion together, something is not there. And so uh, I feel a little bit like those in Jewish exile. This has been going around this week. This is what planted the thought in my head. I feel a little bit like those in Jewish exile who sat by the rivers in Babylon and said, how can we worship when our homeland has been ravaged when everything that is important has been taken away from us, when the house of God has been destroyed, how can we celebrate things like Easter in times like this? How can we celebrate things like the ascension of Christ in times like this? How can we celebrate the communion table in times like this? And the answer is very simply this that the declaration of Easter and the celebration of the communion table and the declaration that Jesus reigns from God's right hand, those are the declarations that remind us that our broken world won't have the final say. 
And so now, even in isolation, even way over here, while you guys are way over there, the Sparks family, we rise this morning and we declare that Christ has risen and Christ has ascended and Christ seats or is seated at the right hand of God. And it's not the same as if we would do that with you. And we look forward to the time when we do that with you. But that declaration in the middle of our scary world gives us a hope to root our courage in because we remember that God is bigger than all that is broken in the world. And so I don't have to live in fear. And to counter that fear, I don't have to go over to the other side and foolishly believe there's nothing to be afraid of. But I can wisely and faithfully, creatively live in the world loving my neighbors in the confidence that whatever the world throws at us, God is bigger than that. And that however the world in its brokenness may try to rebel against God's good wishes for his good creation, God is bigger than that thing that they throw at us. And so we sit and we patiently wait. We sit in the middle of the darkness and we act in courage not foolhardiness, not cowardice, but wise, faithful courage that acknowledges the brokenness of the world, but says, God wins. And so church, I really look forward to the time when I can see you again. I think we're probably headed in that direction. That is my fervent prayer. But until that time, we still stand to declare that this is God's world and we are his people and by loving our neighbors we are doing his will and so may God bless you in doing that be courageous not afraid and not foolhardy but wise and faithful resting in the knowledge that this is God's world and even though it's broken he wins. Let me pray for you and then you can pray with me. And um, I'll let you guys get out of here so you can go love the world that God has put us in with uh, all the creativity and faith and courage that you can muster. I'm going to finish turning to 1 John 4 before I do that, though. All right, let's pray. Father, grant us the wisdom to know that the world is not as you would have it to be. Grant us the faith to know that you are recreating this world and restoring it into the world that you intended for us to have. That you are recreating us and restoring us into your image bearers that you intended us to be. And Father, based on the victory that Jesus won in his cross and in his resurrection, the fact that you have declared that he sits at your right throne, help us to act with courage and wisdom in the midst of this broken world. Keep us from the sins of fear. Keep us from the sins of foolhardiness. Father, help us to be your people, dedicated to loving those who you have made in your image as best we can. Now we pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who have trespassed against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory now and forever. Amen. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and your mind and your soul and your strength. This is the first and great commandment. The second one like it is this. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Upon these two commands depend all of the law and the prophets. And we love because God first loved us. If anyone says, I love God and hates a brother or sister, he is a liar because the one who can't be or whoever, because the person who doesn't love a brother or sister who can be seen can't love God who can't be seen. 
This commandment we have from him, those who claim to love God ought to love their brother and sister also. We love you, church. We miss you. Have a good week.